I can do it. It's right yep. here. So it's recording now. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday Tea with AT. Um, so today we're going to talk about some remote platforms, and we're going to talk for about 20 minutes and then open up um, for discussion. Um, we ask that during our during the talking portion that you keep yourself muted, and we'll do our best to manage um, participants uh, talking and responding to questions in the discussion portion. Um, but if you could leave yourself muted for now, we'll go ahead and unmute you if you do have a response, or you can put any questions in the chat and we'll also um, address those later. Um, Scott, can you go ahead to slide two? So um, Tuesday Tea is brought to you by the outreach team at California School for the Blind. We provide services to TBIs um, and students throughout California. And at this time, we're providing remote tech support and assistance to teachers who are providing remote instruction. But outside shelter in place, we do offer AT assessments and training, low vision assessments, educational assessments, and short courses and summer camps throughout Cal for, to kids in California. Um, so for more information about our resources and job opportunities at CSB, please visit our website at csb-cde.ca.gov. Um, my name is Vanessa Herndon, and I'm the Low Vision Program Coordinator at CSB. I'm presenting with my colleague and AT specialist, Scott Jaffray, who will start our talk with um, some information about JAWS Tandem. Welcome everybody. So we've been providing uh, remote uh, tech and uh, assistance to the teachers since uh, the beginning of our uh, stay at home order. And we've gone through a, a, a variety of different uh, screen sharing uh, type of apps. Uh, so some of the things that we were trying to do were uh, provide one-to-one -one assistance for teachers and students. And the other thing is really providing tech assistance, uh, getting things installed, uh, setting settings. Oftentimes uh, devices had gone home and they weren't set up for the home Wi-Fi. They were set up for school Wi-Fi. So there was a variety of, of different things that had to, to, had to be done. So we tried uh, quite a few of the different options out there. And uh, the one that I, I really wanted to focus on mostly here is the JAWS tandem. But we'll also talk briefly about some of the other uh, ones that we had some success with. JAWS tandem is a, uh, an option built into the JAWS software. It's built in, so if you have JAWS on your computer, uh, you can connect to another computer running JAWS, which has a big benefit to a, a visually impaired person who's trying to provide tech support or training in that their braille display, as well as the student's display, and the keyboard commands they commonly use for, for JAWS work just fine. So JAWS Tandem comes in two different flavors, JAWS Tandem Center, which is really what we're gonna be talking about. And then there's JAWS Tandem Direct, which is uh, intended for help desks inside of an organization uh, so that somebody on the intranet of a company, business, school could remote access into uh, a device. And it's a, it's a pay service, so. Um, the one that comes free with JAWS is the one that we suggest if you, if you can benefit from this, it's the one to use. So it really connects two JAWS users together to provide training. Uh, you can hear the other screen. They can hear. You can control uh, what they see. Uh, your key commands are interpreted by the, the student system. Um, just as though you were working on your own computer. Um, so you can view, manage, and even take control of the other system. 
And this is the, so the control you can take here is system level. And as we go through some of these, I'll say that several times. System level means you can put in Windows uh, passwords. So like if your computer is uh, locked and you need an administrator's password to do certain things, Zoom, you cannot do that. You can only get up to a certain point. But with something like Tandem, you can meaning that you can actually work on the computer, uh, fixing problems as they come along, and then be able to, to train. So the target system, in this case, the student system, can even be running in 40 minute mode. The difficulty there would be if, um, The difficulty there would be if 40 minutes is not enough time. So it has its, its plus sides and its downsides. Um, but it does require both computers to be running JAWS screen reader. It's, it, it and all of the others require a stable internet connection. I, from what I've seen and found, uh, the, one of the biggest, most important features uh, that is going to make this work or not work is the, um, the quality of the internet bandwidth. It does not work well with screen ma magnification. So at one point I thought that I could, you know, turn on Zoom text and JAWS on the student's computer and then I'd be able to help them. It, it became unusable. Uh, once this, the, the target computer was zoomed in, it, it, it was unusable. You couldn't scroll, you couldn't see what the student was doing. Um, so that really does not work. We also tried it with narrator and that as well. Just as soon as you start zooming in, it just stops working. What we have here as a resource on the screen is uh, we have a, a JAWS tandem quick start guide. Let's take a quick look at that. And this is something that uh, we, we can send it to everybody. So uh, if you're interested in this, you can have a, a nice walkthrough of how this thing works, how to set it up and how to, how to operate it. The overview is pretty much everything that I've gone over. Um, remember, when you go in, use Tandem Center, don't use Tandem Direct. It's not gonna work unless you're on a, uh, like a school or a business network. The, uh, Requirements are obviously internet access, Windows 7 or later, JAWS 16 or later. I actually used it on an older computer with JAWS 17 and it worked fine. Um, target system can be in 40 minute mode. And then there's some technical, uh, it, if it does not work, make sure that your, uh, the internet address for Tandem and the port 12,000 is given access. Uh, you should, probably shouldn't find a problem with that. So we have here the steps to set this uh, session up. Um, it's pretty straightforward, uh, just step by step. You can walk through um, utility, utility menu, open JAWS Tandem, go through all the, all the steps. In the end, you're going to get a session ID number, which you're going to give the student, whoever's on the other end. And that they've made the, that's signing in from the other side quite easy. Insert Alt T is the command that's gonna open up uh, to allow access to their computer. Then all they have to do is type in the code that you give them, tab to the access button, hit press say space bar, and it connects. It's pretty simple. Um, and then during the session, there's a limited number of keystrokes to uh, toggle between the systems, even to uh, remote copy and paste. Remember that this is text only, so you can't, you couldn't give them a file. It has to be text only. You could possibly select the text on your computer system and paste it into a document on theirs. That would work but you could not send them the file. So then again, the same insert alt T to, to end the session. So, and then when you're on the session, you can 
do things on the, the remote computer, or you can watch and listen as the student uh, does their work. And it really gives you a, a way in to see what they're doing. See what they're doing uh, on the assignment, maybe, whatever that you're working with them for. Or if you're working on their computer, uh, you can do what needs to be done. So we will be sending this back out. It's a that's a pretty easy uh, pretty easy process. It just it does require jaws on both ends. And moving on. So we worked on other we worked on other pro, uh, platforms: Zoom, uh, Teams, Hangouts, TeamViewer. Um, and I think I'll pass it over to Vanessa. Okay, thanks. Um, you'll notice that there are several links and resources in here, which we will provide to you at the end of the webinar. Um, and just for your knowledge, this webinar will also be posted on our CSB YouTube um, to access later along with the links. Um, but like like uh, Scott said, there may be several other platforms that you're using, including Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts, um, and maybe even Team Viewer. And so we'll briefly discuss them um, and link to some resources. But I'm going to move pretty quickly through these slides in the interest of getting to the discussion portion of our tea time, as I think there's great value in understanding what you all have been using so far successfully and also problem solving some of the issues that you might be running into. Um, however, these links and resources will be available to you after the fact. Okay, next slide. Okay, so best practices. I'm sure many of you have your own already, but um, it's good to know that any sort of screen sharing or video conferencing um, platform, whatever, is presented via screen share is not accessible to the student. So if your student is using a screen reader, any presentations, um, documents, links to websites need to be shared with them outside of the actual screen sharing option um, so that they can interact with them using their screen reader. Another one is that um, using technology your student is familiar with as much as possible it is really, really difficult to introduce something new when you're doing uh, remote learning. So while we might be teaching a new app or teaching a new skill, try to maximize on the student's strengths as much as possible. And if your student is using a screen reader during video conferences, headphones will help to limit the amount of audio feedback that other participants are getting from the screen reader during the session. Next slide. Okay, so Zoom is probably the most popular way that our students are accessing their curriculum. Um, the actual platform of Zoom is accessible to a screen reader. However, just like any other video conferencing, screen sharing is visually presented and as an image it is not accessible. However, it's relatively easy to perform the basic functions through keyboard shortcuts um, and different voiceover actions to uh, control Zoom. Um, it's great for group chats and um, group classes. And we've listed several resources on this slide, um, including virtual training and access using a Zoom platform with keyboard commands, connecting to a Braille Note Touch Plus via a Zoom meeting, keyboard shortcuts, and JAWS Infusion shortcuts for Zoom. Um, it's relatively easy to use, pretty much plug and play. We'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, Microsoft Teams uh, may be being used by some organizations. It's free for personal use on a variety of platforms. Um, there is a screen share option and we have not used this at CSB with students. However, there is a lot of documentation provided by Microsoft on accessibility, which we've linked here. Uh, we linked the quick start guide and some accessibility documents that they have provided. 
Um, this does have a screen share option, but it does not have a screen control option, which I'll talk to you about later when we get to Team Viewer. Um, go ahead to use the next slide. So um, I'm interested in and knowing if any of you are using Google Meet or Hangouts since Google Classroom is widely popular um, during social distancing. Um, it is free uh, through business and educational G Suites and also free to almost anybody who has a Gmail account. Um, it is accessible as a participant and screen sharing is available in the video conference format and we've also linked to some resources to using Google Meet and Hangouts with a screen reader, including Google Meet slash Hangouts for the blind and visually impaired user and Hangouts with a screen reader. We're gonna go on to slide nine, which is TeamViewer, which I think is such a cool application for use with our students currently, especially if we're running into some technical difficulties. So, Screen Reader, uh, sorry, Team Viewer is an application that's free um, for home and personal use. There are different solutions that are free, and I'm going to talk mostly about the remote access solution. Um, the, the best thing about this is that it gives you remote access to a target device. So if you had this set up on your computer or on your iPad, and your student had it set up on their computer or their iPad or their Braille note or their Android tablet, you're, you can control what's happening on their device from a distance. So you can control their device, you can provide direct support. Um, I've heard various frustrations from TVIs about how even if their student is really good in technology, there are constant struggles and technical issues, and this application can help with that direct troubleshooting. Of course, we do also want to make sure we're supporting best practices and not jumping in every time there is a need, but only when the need is beneficial. So we should continue to support students in dependence and them asking for help and problem solving on their own or calling tech support themselves. However, this can be a powerful tool when support is needed. Um, this platform is also used by IRA to provide remote support. So if your student does use that service, they may already be familiar. Um, there's not that much documentation on using TeamViewer. However, I think one of our participants here created the resource that I've linked um, Mallory created a, a document about using TeamViewer to provide remote support to a Braille Note Touch. Um, and it was a really cool way that she uh, figured out how to provide support to her student during math lessons without being in the math lesson. So I recommend definitely taking a look at that resource and looking into TeamViewer to see if it is a good resource for your student if they're using an iOS or a computer or another type of tablet. I'm going to hand it off to Scott for some of our takeaways. So these are just generalities, but they are uh, quite important. So all of the options we've mentioned have free versions, which is great. Um, only TeamViewer and JAWS Tandem offer the ability to go in and put in Windows passwords and actually work on the system at a system level on the computer. JAWS Tandem is only JAWS to JAWS, but it does allow a JAWS user to assist a JAWS user. So that's really powerful. Internet bandwidth is most important. If you have, and you've all seen in your, the meetings that you've been doing over the last couple of months, as soon as somebody has a low internet signal, it's gonna bog down. It's gonna drop out, audio issues, video stops, and locks up oftentimes. Sometimes the, the screen control of a target computer can require a paid version. Uh, I've personally used several of these. Zoom uh, works really good up to a certain point. You can't, it, when you get to the point where you have to put in a password, you can't do it. So something like uh, Tandem or TeamViewer is, is, are the ones that you really wanna use for that. Um, 
Yeah, and if and if there's magnification on one of the screens, like like the student screen, the it just it's so intense in the amount of video data that is trying to put across the internet to you from them to you, it just stops. So as much as I would like to be able to work with a student with them zoomed in, it just doesn't. So, but then you can do things like make the text bigger, right? You can do things, there are some workarounds that you can do. So uh, work it into your plan. Uh, sometimes you just have to figure out what works. And thank you. This was, uh, I'm glad that everybody could come and visit and maybe now take part in the discussion. Um, I saw a lot of people saying that they were using Google Hangouts and um, Google Meet. Uh, and I'm interested in knowing how that's going uh, for, for you. Um, also, I'm interested in knowing if you guys have found any sort of workflows that you think are best for teaching your student remotely. This is Mallory. Um, I use Google Meet almost every day with my student using an iPad and a Braille Note Touch, and it works pretty well. And yesterday we were able to do screen share pretty easily because TeamViewer connection wasn't working. So he was able to share his screen on that, which was cool. Thanks. Has anybody else used Google Hangouts? I did want to add that really none of these options can control an iOS device. Some of them do allow viewing, which is a big part of what you need when you're working with a student, but actually controlling is a more difficult issue. Um, so. So let's go to our list of questions. While Scott is pulling up that list, maybe we could do a poll. Um, if you wanna participate via chat and say, yes, we can know how many people are using Zoom as a solution with their students. Quite a lot of people. All right, we have about 10 or 11. And how many people are using, um, using uh, Microsoft Teams? Okay, I see. I, I know a couple people did say yes earlier in the chat, maybe five, and um, some people are using it just for staff. So, oh, actually just, just a couple people said they were using it for staff. And then earlier there were five or six people using Google uh, Hangouts and Google Meet, but it looks like Zoom is the most popular so far. Has anybody used uh, TeamViewer? Okay, a few more, a few more people, about three responses I got. Um, so awesome, uh, Scott, can you go ahead and take a look at those questions? Maybe we can yes. drum up some discussion. So some, some of you put in questions when you signed up for the class and thank you for doing that. Um, let's start with the, the top one here. Um, somebody's interested in, in math and braille users. Is there a way to send math remotely so it can be read on a braille display?
Yeah, there, um, there will be actually a great webinar to check out this Friday. Um, Eureka is going to be on there along with uh, people from Sterling Adaptives and HIMSS talking about accessible math documents. Um, Eureka, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, it's this Friday and I will send a blast out on Braille and Teach. So if you guys, um, I'm sure all of you guys are on Braille and Teach, we will cover um, a free, like, I guess my intention was like with the given situation, how can we provide math to our student in Nevis? And so um, we're gonna be reviewing some of the possible options of, of a free way to do that. If you don't, I also know that not everybody has their software, like, you know, if you're using scientific math notebook or math ML um, on their laptop, because it might be at your school um, computer. So um, we've researched um, one way, actually, we'll, we'll talk about several ways, but we are gonna recommend one way that is a free, quite an easy way to put it right into a Word document, which will show up as NEMMYTH on a Braille display. As part of that same question, they had said that they were producing paper Braille and delivering it to the parents, but the parents had asked you to stop. Can you, why were they asking you to stop? It probably has to do with contamination. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my question from like last week, I think. And it was a little addressed a little bit, but dad was having to wipe down every piece of paper Braille. And so he just asked if we could do it electronically, which is, I understand. It would be better. You know, I do my mail. Well, most of it I just throw away because it's junk. <laughs> but then the rest I, I do open up and wipe down. Um, okay, so that we have a resource on Friday. That's great. So we have another question. Somebody uh, talking about enlarging the screen on Zoom. So if you were a, a, a Zoom text user, a screen magnification user, you would be able to magnify the screen just like always and zoom into different areas of the screen. Um, if you were presenting and you wanted to maybe make it more accessible to somebody with a visual impairment, you could make the size of your font larger, right? So that maybe they won't have to zoom in. So we always have to think about that. So this question was about Google Classroom. So Zoom does work with Google Classroom. Um, it works with Zoom text. And you can, of course, adjust the, uh, the size of the font and, and the contrast, depending on the, the size and uh, color of the background and the text. So it, it would be accessible. So this one sounds like it might be for Vanessa. How could we do Braille instruction over video conferencing? I think that was maybe meant for next week's discussion. Ah. We're discussing Braille uh, learn, learning from a distance. Okay. Mm, doo, 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 doo. So the next one, pretty much we've already covered. Um, screen sharing remotely for iOS. There aren't, th there are ways to see the screen, but not uh, doing anything much more than that. Um, we tested out uh, Apple Classroom, which has the ability uh, when, you're, when you're on the same network to view and, and send files and do a lot of cool things between iPads. But as soon as you take uh, the, the student iPads off campus and away from your local area network, it, it no longer works. So it would be nice if it did, uh, but it was something that, that did not pan out as something that we could use right now. You know, in the classroom, it works fine, but in remote distances, it does not. As far as just screen sharing goes, any of the um, things that we talked about today, excluding JAWS, so Zoom, um, Google Hangouts, um, TeamViewer, um, I'm not sure about Microsoft, but those should all give you the option to share your screen with the student. And the last uh, question here, um, yes? Oh, I was going to say, um, a few days ago, I was looking for something that 
This is Carmen. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for this <laughs> uh, training. Um, I was looking at options with Team Viewer, and it looks like there's several, at least one or two uh, Team Viewer apps for the iPad. Depending on, you know, somebody gives access to to your iPad to somebody, or you want to serve it. Do you guys um, have you do you know anything about that? Whether it's a good system to use. Let's Could see the. Uh, you it's, cut it's, up, cut out some. Could you give the name of that again? It's called. Um, let's see. I'll tell you. Um, they have several versions of a uh, Team Viewer. Let me see. I'll tell you in one second. I'm going to the app. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to the App Store. Okay. Team Viewer Good. is available on iOS. And if we went back to our uh, slideshow, I believe it was Android as well, correct? So they have the uh, Team Viewer Remote Control and Team Viewer Quick Support. So they have uh, a couple of uh, versions. So, uh -huh. so. I have not, I, I don't think we've checked. Have you tested I, that? I can help with this if you'd like. Sure. So uh, they have the remote uh, control and then the the quick support and yeah because um so, I you know I do have kids who have iPads and yeah. <laughs> I'm trying so, to be able to Carmen, get there and use them yes yeah so there is a couple of different yes. apps available um, so the quick support app is the app that you want to put on the device you're going to be viewing so that's the app that your student wants on their device. And then the remote support app is the one that you as the teacher want so that you can view their screen. So yeah, there is a couple different Thank apps you. Though, and they're for different applications. Does that make sense? But that's just viewing, that's just viewing, it's not actually controlling. It's going to depend on on what platform you're going from what platform. Um, so for example, if you're using the remote support app on Mac or PC, um, you actually can click around and make changes. Um, but if you're using like an iPad, it's going to be just primarily viewing. Um, it does. It depends a little bit on the system that you're working with and its capabilities. Um, but if if it is a Mac or a PC, then yeah, you could actually click around unless you were trying to view a student's iPad. Unfortunately, I think Scott, you said this earlier. iPads, you really can't interface or transfer files or anything like that. It will be primarily viewing in that in that case. Um, so it does depend a little bit on what system you're viewing from and one system, what type of system you're trying to view, but um, you can, depending on what you're doing. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, John. Yep. So our last question on this, uh, of the ones that you put in when everybody signed up, is asking about uh, how can you work with a student reading Braille when you're on line with them and i would think that you could send them braille sheets you could be in a, a shared google doc and they could have their braille display um, so i would think mostly all the ways that you would normally access braille on your device you would just have to make sure that they have access to it you've either e emailed it to them it's on a uh, in a shared doc or it's brailled out I know that some of our students, our, our teachers are uh, brailing out packets and sending it home to the students. So do we have any more questions in the chat? Yeah, um, we have one question about creating BRFs for students who are using Chromebooks. They're wondering if software like Braille Blasters or Perky Deck, which are free Braille transcribing softwares, work with a Chromebook. Um, in terms of creating BRFs, uh, I don't see a download for Chromebook for Perky Duck, um, just for Windows and Mac, but I believe that, um, I'm wondering uh, what the purpose of the BRF for the Chromebook is first, I guess. I was trying to create um, a BRF so that I could go in um, into, because I don't have Braille 2000, 
Um, so I wanted to create and then um, use an embosser to um, actually print it out and then send it to a student. Oh, from your personal Chromebook? Uh-huh. Okay, I am not sure about the answer to that question. So if anybody has a good answer for creating Braille documents on a Chromebook, please chime in. Uh, what kind of Braille embosser do you have? A Juliet. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so you may be able to do it. Um, what you would have to do is you'd have to connect your Juliet to Wi-Fi and you have to use or excuse me, I should actually ask one more question first. Is it one of the older Romeo, or sorry, excuse me, the older Juliet's, or is it one of the newer ones? Newer. Newer, okay, perfect, okay. <clears throat> um, so you'll have to connect that to your in-home Wi-Fi, and then once you do, you can press help and then 10 on the embosser, and it will actually tell you your embosser's IP address. You can then type that into your Google Chrome web browser, and that will take you online to a little landing web page, which will give you options to upload files to the embosser and braille them from there using the embossers onboard braille translation engine. Um, so a couple things, since you're working from a Chromebook that you'll need to do is you'll need to make sure it's in either a Word doc, accessible PDF, text or BRF file format and it will have to be saved locally to your machine. It can't be in a cloud file service like Dropbox or Google Drive. Um, okay. But once, if you, if you have that, you can go online that little portal, um, upload your files, it'll even preview it for you in Braille. You can even do a little bit of editing there, send it to the embosser and it will uh, translate and emboss for you. So, yeah, oh, hope that thank helps. You. Thank you, yeah, it does. I see Michelle also shared a link um, to a Braille transcribing website um, that you might want to check out in the chat. So would anybody like to share their experiences with uh, different distance uh, type of applications that we've been talking about? Um, so if you have any sort of issues that you're uh, coming into, I think a great value of having a bunch of TBIs on a video chat is we can all help problem solve. Um, hi, this is Carmen. May I a ask a question? Of course. Okay. Um, so I've been using mostly Zoom with my students. And um, today I was... I shared my screen and I wanted to show them how to go into the student, how to go into, uh, into uh, the Google Drive and uh, open a document there uh, and uh, open it into a scanner app. And uh, several times it just stopped working. I been able to share with other other parents uh, and students my screen, but today, like four times, they kicked us out. Um, do you think that's it's the, the Wi-Fi that's your student that? using magnification? I don't. Because um, in my experience, um, magnification just—it's just too much. He was using. Um, he was using uh, a, a Mac, and I don't know whether he was using magnification, but they also live in Gilroy, which has, a, you know, it's a little more rural, and the, the Wi-Fi sometimes is not as good as, say, when I'm calling people, contacting people in Milpitas or San Jose with Zoom. Do you think it could also be Wi-Fi, maybe, the internet strength? That's always a, that's always a, probably the main culprit. The most of the time, and you guys spend a lot of time in these type of meetings, you see it all the time where somebody's, the, the audio starts going crazy, the, you know, it freezes up, maybe it freezes up totally. Um, so I guess if I, if I was in that situation, I would ask the student, you know, do you have uh, magnification on? Maybe they can turn it off. Um, as long as they can still obviously access the screen. So it seems like magnification is just a, a problem when it comes to this. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else want to uh, tell us about any interesting issues or success stories too, right? What's working for you out there? It doesn't have to be just the bad stuff. Have you tried something that we haven't talked about? Can I ask something? Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Um, not you, Jim. Um, the steps that John Taylor described about 10 minutes ago, are they written down someplace? The, there was a lot of <laughs> steps oh, to that um, BRF question. Yeah. Is there some place uh, to look at those, a list of those steps? That's something I work on. it would not be today, um, but I have everybody's, we're gonna have everybody's email, so we can send that out. Do you know that anything, be, John? Um, that is, I don't believe it's written out, especially not for Chromebooks. Um, I think there are some minimal instructions on Enabling's website, um, but I don't think they're actually listed out anywhere um, that I'm aware of anyway. Let me see what I can do. And I can, if nothing else, a general, you know, the steps you're going to take, uh, it may not be specific to Chromebook, but at least you, if you know what you're looking for, uh, then you go. If, if you all don't mind, I'm happy to share my email address as well, and people can contact me on an individual basis, and I'm happy to help with that and walk you through it for a first time. You're hired, John. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. You're a giver. <laughs> all right, I'll put my email that. address in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. We will be saving the chat, and you know, once we do a little cleanup on it, we will uh, be posting it. So. Perfect. Just put it. Thank you, John. Anybody else have any horror stories or uh, things that have been working great for you? I want to know if anybody has been um, teaching new technology or, or new skills to, to kids and what kinds of uh, troubles are you running into in terms of that and what kinds of successes, just specifically in terms of um, making sure students have access to their AT uh, during distance learning. If no one's going to say, I can, <laughs> I can talk. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a kindergarten student who um, didn't really, you know, know how to access Google Classroom, so I was able to, uh, uh, her brother's also my student and he's a little older, so we were, I, we were able to use Zoom and I was able to show them by sharing my screen, uh, you know, how you go into, how you log into Google Classroom, et cetera, how to get in there, how to go to your teacher's classroom, assignments, et cetera. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we were able to, by using that, I was able to show the student and then together the student and I walked, uh, walked uh, the, uh, my, the little girl uh, through so she could learn to, to, you, to access the basics of Google Classroom so she can get it into her classroom and see her assignments. That's great. And there's Thank other you. things you can do. You could make Google Classroom the home page in the browser. So all they have to do is make a new browser window. And as long as they stay signed in, they're right there. A lot of times our, our teachers with some of the, uh, the younger kids are sending an email with a link. So as long as they can get into that email and click the link, uh, it takes them right into the meeting. So if you can find uh, less strenuous ways that don't rely so much on the tech heavy skills you might need to open up classroom or uh, open up a, a particular doc uh, clicking on a link is it's a viable way of doing it thanks so much does anybody else have any ideas they can share hi Spartan Vanessa I'm Debbie Seplett up here from Washington State School for the Blind and um, I just wanted to share an interesting Zoom meeting that we had with um, a student and the parent and the entire team. So in attendance to that Zoom meeting was a 
resource teacher and OT, a PT, a teacher of the deaf, an interpreter of the deaf, an interpreter for the uh, Spanish interpreter, the deaf um, interpreter's aide, and the TVI. And this was all going on at the same time while we were on Zoom, and it was just it went great, it lasted twice as long, but it was an amazing experience. So that's all I have to share. We've had that situation here and, and things that have worked for us was like having the Spanish interpreter being on a separate phone call with the parents so that she could translate in real time. And then she gives us, then gives us a, a, uh, a motion that she tells us when they're done. And it really doesn't take that much longer than it normally does when she's translating in a, you know, in a meeting when we're all in the same room. So, you know, remember that you can do multiple uh, connections like that as the case may require. That was cool. Anybody have anything? I, hi, I have a question. Um, it has to do with with zoom and I understand about using larger text and so forth I mean sometimes I'm jumping from my iPad to my desktop to my to my laptop all in the same session and of course the kids get a kick out of it because then they get the background feedback and when I'm changing from one to the other and you know uh, because not all the programs um, adapt easily from, let's say, iPad to the laptop, I might be doing something else for them to help them out. One of my biggest things, and I've searched, and I don't know if anybody's run into it or found a solution, is that the icons on the Zoom window itself has been too small for some of my students, for one of my students to read. Now, I understand I can turn on the magnifier, but this is a student where I can't have too much going on at once due to other disabilities. I'm trying to get her to stop because when I present her things on the iPad, well, she has the iPad and, and I'm presenting her different things and she just wants to touch everything. Like if she was, has the, you understand like the iPad in front of her, but she still doesn't understand that um, she can't touch the window only I'm the one managing it. Um, but there are times where I want her to share hers and she can work, like we have this Abacus app. She loves the sound. She loves pushing the beads up and down. Um, but it, it's a big thing to then have the parent come over and find the share and go on. Is there, is there a way I can at least increase the font or maybe the icon um, so she can see it better because she has very, very minimal um, uh, residual vision left, and, but she just, she wants to participate. And I want her to participate, you know, showing me how she, sh how she found another story in, in, in Learning Ally and everything. Is there a way to increase that? Because I have not been able to find it. One thing that I might suggest you do is turn on guided access so that you can block, visually block out the other um, icons and she wouldn't be able to visually access those icons and then um, if she does know how to zoom in and zoom out with a three finger double tap she should be able to locate that icon visually um, if i'm understanding your question uh, no she hasn't been we haven't been able to get through certain things like that because then she keeps wanting to tap the window <laughs> so you know uh, like the icons themselves like where it says mute and video and share and all those that we see I was just wondering if there was a way where I can have it preset and just live leave it alone where just these icons are larger um, I know so I am I know I'm basically the oldest one here but the first thing I think of is just a handheld mag magnifier to okay. pick it up and <laughs> <laughs> it's really very very retro I know Sometimes but sometimes that works. Right. There are ways within iOS to increase the text size. Uh, text size. So mm -hmm. it's better than it was. It used to be, you know, only the Apple apps. Um, now mm -hmm. it's been, it, it works in, in more places um, so that you can set the default size of the text. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, that really doesn't change the size of the icons. Yeah. 
Okay. I mean, I, I would have to try it, but uh, if voiceover was on on the student's uh, iPad, they wouldn't be, you know, touching might move the cursor, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't open up something or take you someplace totally different. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a difficult way to probably do it, but. Yeah. And that, and I would love to start introducing her to voiceover, but um, she's one of she she's one of those where like once something grabs her attention, I've lost her for the rest of the session, and that's all she wants to do is like that new thing, and <laughs> and then I can't get her back for anything else. So I've just I have to introduce her things step by step. Like right now, the biggest thing with the distance learning has been the iPad, and all she wants to do is touch the iPad and play with it. And I have to tell her, stop, you, you now, like you blocked out your screen and, or now you're mute and I can't hear you or something. <laughs> yeah, I think I would try starting with the guided access. So at least if she does touch the screen um, on some sort of icon that she can't see and doesn't know what it does, at least it's not disrupting your video and your, and your microphone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, depending on if you can guide the parent through doing this, perhaps there's a way to kind of highlight that area so it's a little bit more visually available. Um, uh -huh. Even though the actual icon might not be accessible to her, the area that she needs to touch may become more accessible. Okay. All right. I will try that. Thank you so much. And uh, One other thing I would suggest is at that age, you know, when somebody's really new and they, they really don't understand the cause and effect of what they're doing, uh, things like a fireworks app where you touch the screen and it does something, right? You want to get the, the student to have that idea that I'm causing something to happen. So then hopefully they develop the concept that if I touch that, it may well do something. Because right now it doesn't sound like the student has that real concept. Or maybe they're just enjoying the fact that they're making it do something. But in a something like a, a fireworks app where they touch it and fireworks go off, they touch it somewhere else and it goes off over there, um, can sort of help build that idea that there's an there's an effect for what I do. Something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then when you later move on to swipes and voiceover, you know you're taking it one step further. Yeah, are looking um, for teaching voiceover to to her via distance. Um, there are some great cause and effect apps such as VO Lab, um, which teaches gestures one at a time through a series of games, um, which I really like. And then there's also Ballyland, which I think is a little bit more advanced. But it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will try those out. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we have just uh, about five minutes left. Does anybody have any uh, have anything else? Tell us your your worst experience, your best experience. I'm having a lot of trouble uh, troubleshooting technology over Zoom with um a student and their family and i'm not like physically there to see what they're doing to see if they're following my what i'm telling them to do the way that i'm telling them to do it so that i find that difficult because i'm like it should work if you do this and then they're like oh no i did that and it didn't work <laughs> and then i'm like okay we'll try it this way <laughs> oh no it didn't work so it's like, I don't know what the issue is because I can't see how they're doing it. Yeah, I've had a lot of the same um, problems when trying to troubleshoot with um, students and their families. And depending on what they're using, like I was having a lot of issues in giving direction to a student using a Braille display, which you obviously can't share screens on a Braille display. So. Um, you may have to be inventive in like where the camera's pointing on like a phone or having the, the parent show you what's actually happening on the screen so that you can know what's what's going on on the screen. Um, and then maybe using some of the screen sharing app uh, 
portions of the application that we talked about in order to see the student screen while you're providing that tech support can be helpful. Um, it's not ideal, but you can kind of piecemeal something together that way. Can you yeah. use it can you I, with the iPad and a Focus 40? Say that one more time. Uh, the, the issue I'm having is with a Focus 40 connecting to an iPad. Can I use the, the Team Viewer for that particular setup? Yeah, you can use Team Viewer or Zoom um, to connect via a conference to the student, via video conference to the student. And then with, so within Zoom, then you can, the student can share their screen to you. Um, and then Team Viewer, you could also hook that up and it's a little bit of a different process. Like John touched on, you have two different types of apps. Um, and you connect to the student's screen, um, though you can't uh, control an iOS app, but you would be able to see the screen while you're troubleshooting with the kid. Okay. But I can't That's, remotely access. Yeah. Okay. That's really the, the, the reason why we went started down this path in the middle of March. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been a learning process. It's been frustrating. Uh, the students really love it when we finally figure something out. I wish it didn't take so long. Uh, something that takes just a few minutes standing beside them uh, literally can take several sessions over several days. Oftentimes getting a parent or older sibling involved uh, is really the fastest way to do it. And then you can, if you have to teach that later, um, you can work out, work out how to do that. But the, really the, the issue is get it working. And then you can start having some successes because yeah, I, I can talk to um, Rebecca, like one of the troubleshooting um, sessions that I've had was with a teacher and the parent and a braille display. And so on Zoom, they called me on the laptop and she also logged in the same Zoom um, session with her iPhone. And so the iPhone was pointed at the braille display. And so I could actually see what was going on there. And then you could do the same thing, pointing, the, pointing it to the, um, the iPad as well while you're talking on Zoom separately. So um, that we were able to troubleshoot it that way. And that's what I was planning to do with you on Thursday. <laughs> um, we have one last question from Michelle. She says, if a student forgets their iPad password and did not let me know that they put one on. Any suggestions of how to get them in remotely? Um, I think I have a couple follow-up questions for you. Um, if the student's iPad is managed by the school through an MDM, it might be easier. But if not, I'm going to turn this question over to Scott. Yeah, I just helped somebody. It took a long time. You know, lost passwords are fine. Um, usually the problem comes when the, whoever did it sets up that second factor, you know, the two factor where you have to, it makes your phone ring. And then of course, then they have for, forgotten that phone number. So depending on how it was set up, it could be uh, as easy as send an email to the uh, connected email address and then click on that link. Um, another way is to um, to know the answers to the, the questions that were asked when it was set up. Of course, these are things that we as third parties that weren't there don't know. <laughs> so it's like, whose number did they use? Who answered the questions? I don't remember. Um, so in the end, I ended up having to go through Apple. Um, we had to prove that it was purchased by them and luckily they had the receipt. Um, and then once they verified that it was, it was really their iPad, they unlocked it. Um, but Apple has, has, and, and we like Apple because of their security, but it does lay in a layer of difficulty when people forget their passwords. So, you know, answering the security questions, um, knowing the phone number, it's as simple as, you know, the, one of the options is, do you remember the phone number that you used when you set it up? If you do, you just have to put in the last four characters of that phone number and bang, it's done. But the gentleman I was helping didn't remember that. 
So that's a tough question. You, you can't get into it remotely until you can get it unlocked. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Unless there's any burning questions, I think we're going to wrap up our Tuesday tea. Um, we have another one next week on prom providing remote Braille instruction. Um, and the link from this week's Tuesday tea will also get you in um, to the, the meeting next week. And you remember uh, Eureka has the, uh, the math. Yeah presentation. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to uh, save this chat and uh, Michelle, I'll, I'll try and get back with you with a, I have a document around here with the, the steps to unlock an iPhone. I'll, I can get that to you. All right. Bye, everybody have a wonderful Tuesday tea.